thanks for having me. It's really my pleasure to be here today. Despite the time change, overnight flight, it's great to see such a sea of excited faces. You guys are wide awake. Um, all right, so I have been studying honeybees for about 20 years now, ever since I was the age of the students I now work with. And I have always been interested in the problem of pollen for our colonies. I started working on this as a PhD student. I'm actually, I'm, I'm Canadian, so up in Canada, pollen is a scarce commodity for much of the year. We have very long winters, and our bees have to hustle for just over a slim number of months of the year to try and pack in everything they need to live throughout the rest of the year. So my PhD worked a lot, or it looked a lot at just how critical pollen is to get those colonies going. And then when I moved to the US, I've been there for 12 years now, uh, partly as a postdoc in Tom Seeley's lab, now I'm in my own lab at Wellesley College, and uh, it has been still on my mind the whole time. I've spent some time, I'm gonna, my other talks at, at the National Honey Show will be about some of the other research that I've done, but I keep returning back to the problem of pollen. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about, about that work. All right, so let's start at the beginning because the question of why pollen is so important to bees has been a, a puzzle for some time. And, it, and really, I noticed that the Jockey Club was established in 1750, and that is the first time that a report was made to the Royal Society of London describing how important bees were to flowers, that they were the individuals that likely carried the pollinating dust between flowers that help them, what Arthur Dobbs called it was the male seed. And he figured that the bees ran up and down the female parts of the flower and the dust that they carried was very important for pollinating those flowers. That was the first documented recording of, of, that, of the idea of pollination. And he made this report as part of a larger report to the Royal Society of London. Um, and in that report, it was really about where wax comes from. And he was wrong about that. He thought the bees defecated out wax and then shaped it into the comb. But he was right about a couple of things. First, that pollen is carried by bees between flowers for reproduction. And also that our bees are constant in their floral visitation. So while there might be a lot of different bee, or a lot of different flowers out there, the bees were visiting specific flowers on a given foraging trip and being very faithful to those flowers as they, as they moved around. And this was something suggested way back by Aristotle and something that he confirmed as well. Uh, next up on the docket was an interesting man named Francois Hubert. Have you guys heard of Francois Hubert? He, yes, the blind Swiss um, observer who worked with his wife and his uh, servant to create the first book-leaved observation hives. And he was doing an experiment as well, trying to figure out exactly where wax came from, because obviously Arthur Dobbs did, did not figure it out properly. And to do that, he was trying to confine the colonies with only honey. And he noticed that while for some time they would continue to build wax, what they started to do was really neglect the brood. And so through his experimentation and the observations of those around him, they noticed that when they put brood or pollen comb back into these nectar or honey only colonies that the workers would descend upon this, this pollen filled comb and greedily feast on it and they sprinkled a little bit of dust on top of those workers and can trace them in their leaved observation hives to moving after consuming all of this pollen towards the, the starving brood that needed that pollen. So on this side of the pond, people were figuring this out pretty quickly in the 1700s, moving through the work of various important individuals. It was not the case in the US, where in all, as late as 1929, the import of bees were banned by law into the state of Utah because of a myth that had been perpetuated for some time that bees stole from flowers the things that they needed to set seed. So the state of Utah completely banned the import of bees in, in an attempt to save the alfalfa crops that they were trying hard to grow. Um, it wasn't until you know, later work, this is about five years later, this is C.L. Farrar, who was an apiculturalist in the high plains of the US. He published a paper that I love the title, Bees Must Have Pollen, 
And he showed that to get the colonies through the winter, they needed to have pollen. And simultaneously, plant researchers were showing that the plants needed the bees too. So eventually, we caught up on my side of the Atlantic, but it wasn't until maybe you know, 150 years later that we began to fully appreciate the power of bees for, for our crops and the need for the bees to have access to that pollen. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about work that I've been doing in my lab for the last five years. And it's based on this need that the bees have for pollen, specifically the need that they have for it during their larval development. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. So let's just start on the same page here. Bees need to eat two types of processed food. The first type is honey, so collected from flowers as nectar and processed by bees into honey. The second one is bee bread, collected as pollen from, from flowers and processed by bees and, and their associated bacteria into bee bread. And that pollen is key for providing the colony with virtually all of its nutrients. I always tell my students that honey is like staying up all night to study and drinking only Coke. It's a bunch of sugar, and eventually the bees would crash without access to pollen. And in fact, there has been really interesting work done in the mid-1900s that showed that if you completely starved a colony of pollen, the researcher who did this work found that after two weeks, uh, the bees completely abandoned their queen, ab abandoned all of the brood, and he in fact found the queen wandering around outside one day when he returned to his hive. So, you know, the bees need to have pollen in their colony to keep their cohesion, to keep their focus, to keep looking at their brood and keep attending their brood. So they get their, their vitamins, their minerals, their lipids, their proteins, all of that comes from pollen. What do they need it for? The first recipient of this pollen, the major consumers of the pollen are about five day old nurse bees. The nurses, which can range in age from you know, a couple of days old all the way up to you know, on average 15 days of age, their peak consumption is known to occur at about five days of age. And they are consuming that pollen, growing their hypopharyngeal glands or their brood food glands, and redirecting all of those nutrients towards the, the brood. And those, those larvae, the, the brood that receive that pollen, are fed the pollen over a course of six days, and they increase in weight from their initial hatching size to 1,500 times their size in the course of three days. So if you could imagine the demand on, for feeding of a single baby that grew in size 30 times a day, you can imagine the multiplicative demand on these nurse bees to supply all of the larvae in their colony with a constant source of pollen. So it's key for larval growth. And it's also key, like I said, to fuel the nursing physiology. So these are dissected out hypopharyngeal glands right here. And we'll have a closer view of them later in, in the presentation of images I've taken in my own lab. And these are glands that need to be fattened up, basically, by the consumption of pollen. And they take those nutrients from the consumption and put, turn them into bee, bee food for the, the baby bees. All right. So how do colonies deal with pollen stress? They have a variety of techniques for dealing with this stress. The first thing they do is just simply reduce the amount of brood. Their strategy is to maintain quality over quantity above anything else. So if pollen stress, the first thing they'll do is try and cut back on the number of bees that they rear. They can also reduce bouts of nursing. So individual larvae will receive fewer visitations in the same day. And this effect can be seen with only a couple of days of rain. The number of times a bee get visit, gets visited over the course of a day will drop off if those bees have been confined to their colony for a period of time. And in extreme cases, when, when really stressed, they'll start to decide who dies, basically. And their first victims will be the youngest larvae, the ones that they have invested the least in. And they'll redirect those nutrients to the older larvae. And they also have a strategy of early capping, trying to get those older larvae to a sealed stage where they can go into a developmental phase. But what tends to happen when they have this kind of stress, this kind of pollen stress in a colony, is what you get, despite the attempt to maintain quality over quantity, you still get undersized bees and bees that tend to not live as long. Shorter lived undersized bees. And we've seen this in our own colony. In the, in the spring in Boston, we can open a hive, and sometimes the bees, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but sometimes the bees look noticeably small to us. Tiny little bees. 
And we, when we see these colonies, we like to take some data from them to see if they are just always going to be small or how much they increase over time. And this is just a sample from last year of three colonies where we felt like we saw very small bees early in the season here in May. And then all the way into June, we had pretty small emergence weights that peaked a little bit in June and then dropped down a little bit again in, in July. So worker weight is not standardized. It's not standardized within the same colony, and it can really fluctuate based on the availability of pollen to these, these uh, pollen-starved workers. So our question in, in the lab, and what I'm going to talk to you about today, is the, is the problem of experiencing pollen stress as a growing larva and the impact that that has on your behavioral performance later on in your adult life. So what does it mean to get poorly nourished when you're growing, and how does that affect your ability to be a future nurse or a future forager and a, and a strong contributor to your colony? Yeah. All right, so if we get these undersized, shorter-lived workers with pollen stress, and we want to know something about how this pollen stress affects future performance, we have to get really manipulative within these colonies. So we have to start opening them up, putting them into observation hives, tagging workers, following them throughout their lifetime. And this is really when you need a labor force of young, eager students, which is why it's great to work at an undergraduate college where everybody's anxious to get research experience. And so we have consistently had a great group of students to help us with this research, and I'll try and acknowledge them along the way. So our approach is to create pollen stress in these colonies has been pretty consistent over the years, and I'll try and describe it. What we do is we take a single colony that looks to be doing well, you know, the mite levels are low, the brood pattern is good, it looks visibly healthy to us, which, as you know, is never, it's not a perfect system, but it's better than taking colonies that don't look good. So we try and look for colonies that look as healthy and as viable as possible, and then we split them into three subunits per colony. Um, the subunits range from, the first one will have very limited pollen and lots of brood and lots of um, workers to rear that brood, but not enough pollen available to actually get the full job done. And we can find that subunit so that the bees can only rear the brood they have available to them with what it, we've provided them. They're not able to go out and forage for anything else. And then the, the other two subunits we consider controls. They have tons of pollen in them, brood to rear, workers to do the rearing. One of them will confine just to a test for the effect of confinement, and the other one is also free flying. So those two controls should have adequate access to pollen throughout development and should be able to rear happy, healthy bees. Does that make sense? Okay, so one stress treatment, two control treatments, one confined and one free flying. Then we wait for the workers within these subunits to rear the brood that we've given them. And then what we do is when that brood starts to emerge from their, their sealed cells, we grab them. You've probably seen images like this before, correct? You grab them, uh, you take a little plastic tag. This is one question I get a lot. How do you get all those tags on those bees? Again, labor force of very anxious students who are excited to get involved in honeybee research. Um, and we can mark about 100 of these an hour. And you take a little bit of glue, you put it on the back, you take a toothpick, you lick the back of the toothpick, and then you stick and stick. And so after a while, you can get these age match cohorts of workers where we know which treatment they came from, how old they are, and then we can follow them in our observation hives over the, over the remainder of their lives. So in order to get workers like this, we have to do a lot of splitting of colonies. A lot of these colonies are so stressed that they will not rear workers. They just completely give up brood rearing and say, well, this is what I think they're saying. No, thank you. This is too hard. We don't have enough pollen. We've eaten everything, including, including our larvae that we couldn't raise, and we're giving you nothing for the experiment. But there, about half of those colonies will rear workers. They've, we've just given them that they're on that line between having to give up and being very stressed and still trying to do the best job they can with them. And those, those are the workers that we end up marking and putting into our observation hives, along with matching cohorts of of workers from the control groups. Okay, so we weigh them, we tag them, we put them into observation hives. We know all about how they fed, we know which colonies they're from, we know how old they are. This is one of my students 
former students, Haley Schofield, she graduated and moved to Tom Seeley's lab, so I feel like she's still in the family, basically. Um, and she's been there for several years now, but she did her senior thesis in my lab, and, and we published a paper on the first round of this work in 2015. It's an open access paper, PLOS One, so any one of you can look it up online, and it's, it's free for anybody with an internet connection to download. So what we would do over the course of a couple of years is we would build these observation hives. And here's Haley putting a little cage on top of one of our observation hives. And in it, she has all of those marked bees so we can introduce them to that observation hive. And then we will monitor how long they live and when they start foraging. And again, this is labor intensive work. You need somebody to scan. You need multiple people to scan the observation hive several times a day. And we have several observation hives going at the same time. And then we also have people stand outside of the entrance with these plexiglass covered runway entrances. And uh, this is really where you earn your brownie points in my lab, Sit standing in the sun, counting, trying to learn how to read the tags of these running bees as they run out of this run, literally called a runway entrance. And what we do is we put baffles in there. Maybe you can see a couple of them right here. So it's not a straight shot. The bees have to run a maze before they can come out, which gives us time to see their tag before they go. And we watch for several hours a day in rotating shifts. It's not a perfect system, so that there, there's not somebody there every day. We are taking a sample of who's foraging, but we're trying to track as much as we can when they start foraging, how often they forage, and, and how many days they forage before they disappear from the colony. If, we, if you would like to volunteer, you are welcome to come to my lab. We always need bodies to do this. Um, additionally, we train workers to feeders, and this is something I learned how to do in Tom's lab, where we can have the bees foraging to known food resources, and you can see some of them with tags right here. We also have groups of bees that are just foraging freely in the environment, and we're figuring out where they're going by watching their dances, videotaping their dances, the dance floor of the hive, so that area near the entrance where the busy foragers come back, drop their food, and if they're going to recruit anyone else to the food source they've just been to, whether it's the feeder or a flower in their, in their environment, in their shared environment, we can tell where they've been. If it's the feeder, we definitely know that we've been there because we have another student standing there taking a roll call of every bee that shows up with one of those tags on their back. So this is a lot of labor-intensive work. This is Annie Shen. She's currently doing a Fulbright in Georgia, in Asia, looking at the Caucasian bees and their behavior. So we have a lot of students. It's great because we get students with you know, a, a initial introduction to honeybee research who are falling in love with it and moving on to keep doing this as, as, they, as they age and leave my lab. So with all of this data, we can record recruitment at these hives. We can figure, or we can record feeding rates at these hives. We can also look at recruitment in the form of number of waggle dances that are performed for various food sources out in the environment. And if we decode those dances, we can put a, a pin on a map that says approximately where they were going. So we can get a lot of information from these bees. That's what's so fun about working with them is they're one of the few animals in the world who tells you about their experience. They're not intending to tell you, but we can listen in to what they're doing and get a sense of their experience in, in the wider world, what they've been doing when they're out working hard. So I just want to show you some data that we've been collecting. First of all, I want to say that our method of splitting up these colonies into subunits really works. It does produce visibly, some, sometimes visibly smaller workers in those stressed colonies compared to the control bees. Can you guys see the difference between, it's, it's visible, isn't it? And across, this is uh, the work that I published with Haley. We looked at two different years, but we've continued this work 2014, 2016, splitting up these colonies, weighing them when they come out, and it shows that we can reliably produce smaller workers, sometimes a lot smaller, 37% lighter, 31% lighter, but I will tell you the, the scary thing about this is sometimes we put these bees on the scale and they look, they look normal to us and then we get the weight and we're shocked at how light they actually are. So unfortunately, this is not something you can always detect in your colonies unless you have an analytical scale and you're reliably weighing your bees. You might not have a sense of just how different their weights are when they come out of those brood cells. All right, so we can get these lighter bees we can also get bees that are reliably shorter lived too. So this is again from the work I did with Haley. Uh, we did this three separate times over the two years that we were working together. And you'll always see our pollen stress bees in orange. 
And the blue bars, this is kind of looking a bit blacky, but these two blue bars are the controls. This one is the free flying control, and this color will always be the confined control. And what we saw over time is that these bees are not only lighter, they're also shorter lived. And sometimes these differences are quite stark. Here we're talking about about five days difference in longevity between the stressed and unstressed workers. But this was a remarkable trial where there was on average an 18 day difference between the pollen stressed, the longevity of the pollen stressed workers and those that were reared under adequate pollen conditions. It's kind of shocking. All right. so. We asked a couple of questions in this first work about how this early pollen stress that is clearly manifested in the size of the workers when they emerge from their brood cells, how this manifests in their behavioral performance over the remainder of their lives. And we started off thinking about foraging. So when you're looking at foraging, there are a couple of things you want to know. You want to know how old a worker is when she starts foraging um, and basically how long she forages thereafter and whether or not you saw her foraging in the first place. Remember, here's a shot of one of my students, Amina Ziad, and she is standing outside of this runway entrance recording who she sees, but she's only doing it for about four hours a day. And <laughs> I know, I'm tough on these students. I like data. Um, but we're missing a whole bunch of other days, or I mean other hours in that day. So we're getting a sample of who's foraging. We're trying to catch their first foraging day. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be an approximation, but it gives us a sense of what their activity is. So we want to know the proportion of these treatments that forage, when they started, and how long they foraged thereafter. So we did find that if these bees were stressed, they foraged, we saw fewer of them foraging, but 60% of those that were stressed were observed at the entrance versus upwards of 80 if they were from these control groups. Um, and out of two, Two out of three trials, here we have on the y-axis, mean age at onset of foraging. So that means the day that we first saw them at the entrance, leaving the colony. So according to our observations, the start of their foraging career, basically. So if they were stressed, they, they tended to start it early, to, tended to have an onset of foraging a little bit earlier than those control workers in two out of three trials. So lower percentage of participation, and in some cases, uh, they were starting to participate in foraging earlier than expected than if they had had access to a lot of food. And we also wanted to know a little bit about how hard they work. So the way you measure that is you take the data from your students and you ask how many days in total were from the first day they were seen foraging to the last day that they were seen foraging. What is their foraging lifespan? And trying to estimate that, that number. And again, we saw the same kind of pattern where the bees that were stressed not only were foraging earlier in their life, they were foraging for fewer days in total. And that was a consistent result over all three of these trials. And disturbingly, when we looked at the data a little bit more carefully, we also noticed that there were a very high proportion of these stressed workers, two times more of the stressed workers were likely to be seen only on one day. So, from our best estimates, they went out foraging once, and we never saw them again. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know if they were physiologically not up to the task of foraging and, and just so weakly foraging that we never observed them again. We don't know if they had a hard time finding their way back home. We don't know if they were more inclined to be predated upon. We don't have a sense of what happened to them out there in the field, but we do know that they were two times more likely if stressed to disappear after their first day that they were spotted at the entrance. And this is a disturbing, a disturbing result. All right, so the other thing we did was we tried to get a sense not only of their activity at the entrance, we also tried to get a sense of how well they came back to those colonies and reported where they had been. So there's you know, two important parts to foraging. You've got to get out there and do the work of foraging, but if you have access or experience with a good food resource, you need to come back and tell other individuals about it so that co colony can very quickly capitalize on those good resources. So there's the foraging aspects that I just told you about, but then there's the recruitment asp aspect that comes through waggle dancing, and we wanted to look at that too. So that comes, to get that done, you have to have more students watching more videos of lots of dance floors and trying to get a sense of who pointing out on those videos who's dancing when and then going back months later and watching those videos and recording how many waggle runs they did, how those added up over time, how many times they came back and waggle run, all that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? 
lots of different ways to look at the quality of, of dancing. So we did this only in trial three because it's very labor intensive work, but we did it over a pretty long period of time, longer than a month. We had hours and hours of videotapes and we spanned a pretty wide range, 12 to 45 days of age for the focal workers that we were looking at. And in total, we looked at almost 400 dances done by over 100 workers, 116 workers in total. So the good news, and this is what it looks like inside an observation hive, it's a little bit murky. You can probably see it's not a clear shot as if that glass isn't there. So this is tough work. It requires good eyesight, patience, and um, an ability to just keep doing the same thing over and over again as far as data collection for these you know, young students that are getting used to doing honeybee research. So here's the good news. Uh, oh, actually, no, bad news first, I forgot. <laughs> There's good news to come. Um, we saw a pretty, a pretty low proportion of these pollen stress workers actually participated in dancing. And again, we are taking a sample of total dancing. We're, we're not completely covering all of the times that bees could possibly be dancing in these observation hives, so we're certainly missing individuals. But that, how we miss them should be even between these groups of stressed and unstressed workers. So in the stressed workers, we saw dancing happening, or being, dances being performed by about 9% of the workers that we knew were in those colonies at the time, versus about a quarter at max of the workers that were from the control groups that had been as, as larvae well-fed. And I wanna point out that all of these workers are sharing the same hive as adults. They are in a single observation hive in a shared common environment, and we made sure the entire time that they had access to a lot of pollen as adults. So the stress really was limited to, as far as we could tell from the human side, was limited to this period of larval development. So here's the good news. Once the workers started dancing, if they were of the proportion of the treatment groups, if they took up the task of dancing, their rate of activity was pretty equivalent across the groups, whether we were looking at total dances, total waggle runs, the number of days that we observed. I mean, things were pretty equivalent once they started dancing. The problem was the proportion of bees that took up that dancing task was a lot lower if they were stressed out. And there was another problem too. Um, part of what you can do when you look at waggle dancing is ask questions about how good the quality, how the, the level of the quality of information that those bees are providing. So, one thing that is an element of quality is just how precise those dances are. So if you have bees going to a specific resource and they're all going to that place and we're not moving that resource around, we're keeping it in one spot, in theory, those workers should come back and perform waggle dances that have pr pretty consistent, I think I'm killing the battery on this, pretty consistent waggle runs over time. But that's not really how it works in real life. If you look at individual waggle runs performed by the same worker, there's some inconsistency in the angle of that waggle from run to run. So what you might get is something more like this. Some of them are really straight, if, if, they, if they mean to be straight, if that's the correct direction they should be, should be indicating. But some will be slightly off in terms of the trueness of, of that run. And that will happen across all of the workers. So what we did is we looked at how precise those waggle dances were across both stressed and unstressed groups. And what we found was that the stressed bees performed more imprecise dances as well. So they were less likely to take up the task of dancing. Once they did it, their activity was pretty, their activity level was pretty equivalent, but their dances were not quite as accurate or as precise. Um, and this is a really interesting effect because this problem of imprecision for dances has been seen in a couple of other stress contexts. The first one is if the temperature, when these larvae are developing, if the temperature is not optimal, the workers that uh, are produced from poor, poorly controlled brood areas, as adults can perform more imprecise dances. And the other context where we know that this kind of result is seen is if the bees don't get enough sleep. So you might not have known much about bee sleep, but it is the truth that uh, bees sleep. I get this question all the time from students, do bees sleep? And, and if you've ever looked in an observation hive and you've seen bees around the margins kind of hanging onto the comb with their head like this and their antennae a little bit like that, of course they don't have eyelids, so they're not gonna give themselves away like that, but the bees will rest around the periphery of the colony and um, in one of my friends, Barrett Klein, did this really interesting experiment where he created what he called the bee insominator. 
and he put tags on the backs of the bees, some of which responded to a, mag a magnet and others didn't, and then he would run a magnet up and down the observation hive at regular intervals throughout the night. And some of the bees would get disturbed by the action of the magnet and some of them wouldn't. And those bees that got disturbed by the magnet routinely over the course of, the, of their sleep um, performed more imprecise dances the next day. So sleep stress, developmental temperature stress, and now we know uh, larval pollen stress can cause this kind of uh, signal disruption within these colonies. All right, so we did, let me just check the time here. We did have a lot of questions after we got these results. One of them was, why are these foragers starting to forage so early? And if you think about the important job that bees do in the colony. There's lots of important jobs, but two of the major ones that are the most physiologically demanding are foraging later on in life, but being a good nurse bee earlier in life. And the availability of pollen is really critical to this early stage. The more pollen you have in a colony, the more, the more these hypopharyngeal glands get fueled, the longer the nursing period can go on and the more larvae can be reared. That's the common knowledge through a lot of great work that's been done throughout the 1900s, a lot of it done in, in Germany. So we wondered about these precocious foragers, these foragers that are starting to take up the task of, pol or of, of foraging earlier than expected how that reflected on their, their early nursing periods. We wanted to think about, were these bad foragers, these pollen-stressed poor foragers, also poor nurses? To do that, uh, we marked a whole bunch of bees. So while we were tagging bees, we would also paint mark some bees and put them into a nearby colony and then go in at regular intervals. And these bees were from various treatments, again, the same treatments that I had talked about earlier. Some of them were pollen stressed during larval development. Some of them had adequate access to pollen during larval development. And then every three days, we would go into these colonies, pull out a bunch of bees from these various treatment combinations, and then do some dissections. And this is an image of a bee head, it's kind of gruesome if you haven't actually lifted the lid of a bee face before, which I hadn't done before I did this experiment. Um, my first thought was, I don't want to do this. I feel really, I like my bees alive, just like Kim was saying, and I feel really badly picking my subjects out of the colony knowing that I'm going to have to look at their the inside of their head shortly. But then my second thought when I finally did it was, wow, <laughs> this is kind of amazing in here. I'd never really seen the inside of a bee head before. And um, there's a great book out there by Dade called Honey Bee Dissection, and there's really detailed experiment or explanations about how to dissect bees. And what you do is you cut up one margin of the eye from the mouth, and then cut up the other margin of the eye from the mouth, and then he, I think his term is you lift the mask of the bee off, like, um, I would call it a trunk, car trunk. You would call it the boot, I guess, the lid of the boot. Um, and then underneath, if this is a nurse aged worker, what you'll see on either side are these big, juicy hypopharyngeal glands, or the brood food glands. And they are just glistening. They fill up the entire head. And what's really interesting is as these workers age, these glands atrophy. And there literally is empty space inside of these worker heads when you open up older workers. I couldn't believe it the first time I saw them. And then underneath all of this is the brain of, of the worker. So, but in front of that are these huge hypopharyngeal glands when the work, worker bees are actively nursing. So you can do these dissections and these glands are paired. There's one on each side and they're kind of in a string. Some people call them a string of pearls or you could think of them as grapes on a vine. But when a bee is actively nursing, the grapes on those vines, technically called a sini, will be big and fat and plump like a, a juicy grape. And when those workers transition to out of nursing and into other jobs that are the responsibility of older workers like guarding the entrance or foraging, these acini atrophy and the same string of the, of the gland will look like it has raisins at the end, so deflated with a smaller diameter of acini. So we did a lot of these dissections for both stressed and unstressed workers during their larval development, and we looked at how that reflected, or how their brood food glands reflected that early larval stress. So keep in mind, we usually think of these glands, the physiology of them and the activity of them as being fueled by the adult's experience with the amount of pollen in its colony. 
But what we found was that as these workers aged, and we looked at the mean size of the Asini for these workers, and again, the orange is the stressed bees and the blue are the two controls, the stressed bees, you know, although they did increase, see some increase in the size of their Asini, at about eight days of age, they were statistically equivalent. Generally, their size was small, lower, and dropped off really fast compared to those controls. So something about their larval experience was dictating their adult physiology. And so this, in, in my lab, is not enough to just do the physiology. We really like to keep diving into the behavioral side of things. So in addition to this work, we've gone in and we've had our three different groups of bees marked in observation hives and done some more um, tedious behavioral work. What we do is we, we call it focal following. That's what my students call it. And they basically will pick at random a bee in the hive from each of the three treatments and follow her for 10 minutes. And they'll record over that 10 minutes into a, a, video, a voice recorder whether she's walking in or out of the brood area, if she's diving into a brood cell, how long she stays in that brood cell. And that gives us a sense of of how much time she's spending actually nursing within that colony. And this is what we found with the pollen stress again in the orange. When we looked at the mean inspection frequency, so the number of times on average these workers would dive into brood cells over the course of the 10 minutes that we followed them, it was significantly higher, at least for the pollen abundant unconfined. Um, this one, the control that is sort of in between pollen confined and, but still pollen abundant statistically is similar to the stressed group, but overall we have a you know, depressed level of inspection frequency for, um, for those, col or those workers that come from these pollen stress larval conditions. And although it's not significant, we have a trend towards less time inspecting these cells. So not only are they, well, we know that they're spending, they're making fewer inspections but we have some evidence that might suggest that they're also spending less time doing those inspections, which is the actual time they spend transferring food over. And this is only from one observation hive. We have a matching observation hive that we're still working on pulling the data out of. So we're wondering if we can clarify this non-trend right now and uh, re repeat this trend over here. So we've got more data to come and we're hoping just, it's not great to just only work with one observation hive. We like to do multiple trials. So we have data still out there, the jury's out but some suggestive evidence at this point. So, so far we've, in my lab, we've learned a lot about the long-term effects of early life pollen stress. We confirmed that you can get smaller, shorter-lived bees when they don't get enough access to pollen as larvae, even if they have equivalent access to pollen as adults, that that larval period is really important that there's a, an effect on brood food glands and some evidence of decreased nursing effort if they're stressed out as larvae. And then the foraging, we, we have some pretty strong evidence for the effects on foraging. We know that they're less likely to forage, they don't forage as long, they're more likely to disappear after very short experience with foraging, they're less likely to dance, and their dances are more imprecise. So the, the problems of pollen stress are building for, for these workers. And this is scary for us. We feel like early pollen stress is showing a lasting legacy for the performance of these workers. And even though this is a very brief period, a brief window of time for these workers, it is a critical window of time. It really has some, it gives the bees a bit of a destiny thereafter and what they're gonna be capable of doing relative to workers that are well nourished um, we also worry that, you know, in our, in our experiments, we have really isolated the stress to the larval period only. We have not examined what happens when these workers continue to be stressed as adults, how that impacts the quality of workers that they rear, and whether this cycle perpetuates and maybe becomes, you know, exacerbated over time. We still don't know that, but I suspect it would be, I suspect that it, there would be strong effects if, when, if and when we do look into that. So we're still working in our lab on this nursing data. We're thinking a lot about learning. And we've actually started thinking about bumblebee colonies as well because they're a very interesting system where we have to impose stress experimentally on our honeybee workers because they're so, they try so hard to maintain worker quality in the face of stress. 
Um, bumblebees are interesting. They come in a whole range of sizes within the same colony, and a lot of their size has to do with how well they were fed during their larval development. So we're trying to look at a, another important pollinator that shows the effect of larval stress in the physiology of the workers within the same colony. So we're trying to map some of the, the stuff that we've looked at in honeybees to another important wild bee pollinator as well. So still working hard um, and really deeply interested in this, in this problem of pollen stress for, for workers. So um, before I take questions, I just want to thank the, lar the long list of students in my lab who have been working on this project for the last five years, including the five students here who've done m a lot of work over multiple years, Haley Schofield, uh, we have Annie Shen, Amina Zayad, Corey Loeb, and Anita Yao. And then we have, an, uh, I, I always say, Ed Carls, our honorary Wellesley student. He's a beekeeper who lives in the area, who has been working with my students for the last eight years. He is a great mentor. He loves to show them how to do colony inspections. Uh, he comes to all of our lab lunches, and he's an, honor, he's an honorary Wellesley student in, in our books. And then uh, the funding that we have. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions if there's time. I just asked, during your research, um, have you determined which pollens are better for the bees? Which ones give them the most nutrient? That's a great question. We don't really look at that. We look at the mix of pollen that are in these colonies naturally. We don't manipulate the sources or try and... That's a really difficult thing to do. Um, there's been a lot of work done in the, you know, for a long time especially in the 20th century, looking that clearly shows some pollens are better for bees than others. What also is important is how that pollen has been processed, whether it's fresh, how long it's been stored. There are a lot of different factors that determine pollen quality. So we've neatly stepped aside of that complicated question and just dealt with what, if we look at a single colony to split up into subunits, we take what it has and we divvy it out back to the colony without really assessing the quality or the nature or the sources of those pollens. I think we'd need a whole other team of experts to try and figure that stuff out. Next do, you, do you think scout bees have been better fed than the ordinary bee? Do I think what kind of bee? Scouts that look out for new sources, um, you know, the ones that find sources, A, for a home or new foraging sources. Oh, the scouts. Yes. Um, do I think that they have had better nutrition? Yes. That's a really good question. I think if you look at a colony, um, that's hard to answer, actually, based on what we've been doing, because we were really taking the same colony members and forcing them down a pathway of either ex experiencing stress or no stress, you know, in our books. Um, we have never looked at specific individuals in a colony that did have access to all of the potentially, all potentially the same nutrient to see if the most active individuals have markers that reflect personally that they have been better nourished compared to their nest mates. That's a, it's an interesting question, but we haven't done it. Thank you very much, Heather. Can I be very boring and ask a question about the methodology? You talked about weighing the bees. Weighing the bees, yeah. yeah. Individually, dead or alive, or? Oh, no, they're alive. What we do is we put the, we take the frames, we put them into an incubator, and um, we monitor the incubators pretty constantly. We'd like to get them really close to having emerged from those cells. So without having very much ability to really eat any food in the colony or, or anything like that that would increase their, rate, their weight. So these are frames that don't have other adult workers on them. Uh, so there are no nurses there to start, you know, helping them feed or anything like that. And we usually catch them within about probably 10 hours max after their emergence. So there would be some noise in there, but it pretty much is you know, as close to their day zero age as we can grab them. Can I ask, have you done any work on whether there is more pollen stress over the winter months with bees that can't get outside the hive? And as a corollary to that, is there any um, quality of pollen deterioration over that period? Oh, good question. Well, as a Canadian who you know, worked with colonies that couldn't get out for, you know, 
except for cleansing flights, but really no access to new pollen for up to seven months out of the year. You know, these colonies are stuck with what they have inside their colonies or whatever supplement or extra pollen frames they're given. Um, there is some evidence that stored properly in a, in, in a nest, processed by bacteria and packed in with honey over top that pollen and the, nutri the nutritive value of it is pretty stable over the winter. It's pretty reliably stable. Um, it's when you start taking pollen frames out that some beekeepers say, if I harvest pollen frames in the fall and then hope to feed them back in the spring, uh, will that work? And the question is, what are you doing with those frames when they're out of the colony? Are they just staying at room temperature? How are you storing them? You know, room temperature can degrade pollen quality pretty fast, but the way that the bees pack it and the way that it, the conditions it experiences over the winter, there's pretty good evidence that the brood rearing capacity of that pollen is fairly stable over time. Have I completely answered your question? That was a complicated question. follows on from that one. Um, although it's not directly about the pollen, I noticed in your graphs that the, bee, the control bees that were confined yep. had at times reasonably significant differences yes. from the uncontrolled ones. Does this reflect something to do with the quality of having incoming forage as opposed to stored forage? I, yeah, I think you're right. So we have, in the case of the control group that was confined, sometimes in some instances they're intermediate between the really stressed group and the adequately fed free-flying group. And we know from work that was done in Carl Krelsheim's lab in you know, the 1990s that if you force a colony to stay inside, I think how they did it was interesting. They would fake a rain event at the entrance with a sprinkler system. So even though the weather was adequate, the bees perceived that they could not leave. And so they would be confined to the colony in a rain event for up to five days. And over that, which is you know equivalent to pretty much the whole open brood period for an individual worker that hatches from a larva or an egg and then till the time that she's sealed, that just the act of being confined like that would reduce the incidence of nursing frequency for, for workers. So we did expect that confinement could have an impact in addition, that could be you know, an extra factor in addition to be pollen, being pollen stress, stressed, which is why we included that control. But what we found was um, sometimes it did and sometimes it didn't show as strong an effect or an intermediate effect as we might have thought. So I do think confinement on its own even with adequate pollen available, does in, enforce some stress on the bees. When nurse bees are feeding brood, is there any evidence that they might favor um, those within their own patria line or do they just um, feed across the board? Yeah, the evidence of, uh, for favoritism of super sisters or full sisters over half sisters is, is kind of, it's mixed. In some instances, people have found evidence that uh, there is favoritism of workers for their full sisters in swarming, context, uh, swarming contexts. And then sometimes when those experiments are repeated, they can't find that effect. And some have argued that it's not beneficial for workers to really be able to perceive these dis differences, that there is, that if you remove some of that conflict between who a worker perceives she might want to help versus not help, that it creates more productivity for the colony in general, and that uh, some people argue that an inability to detect full versus half sistership um, has evolved specifically to avoid some of that conflict. So the, the evidence is pretty, um, it's in disagreement, I would say, over that. And in, in general, there isn't strong evidence that they can really discriminate. Um, if I understood it correctly, you took a single colony, split it three ways to get your three uh, colonies for the trial. Yep. One of those colonies would have the original queen. What methodology did you use to get queens into the other two? Yep. And therefore having queens from a different source, yeah. what was the impact on the overall health of the the trial colonies? No, that's a good question. And we did not know the best, there is no perfect way to address that problem, but we thought the idea of introducing new queens into these subunits for the brief window of time that the workers would be rearing, you know, it's really a six day period that we keep these subunits separate, then we pull out the frames 
and put them into an incubator because we really want to target those workers who have experienced stress from the first day of their larval period day of their larval period to the last day. So our solution to that was to not mess with putting queens from foreign colonies into these subunits for that three day window of time, or six day window of time. What we did instead is we used lures, so queen lures, which is a less than ideal solution, but it decreases the conflict that can come with the problem of introducing a foreign queen over that same period of time. You know, most of us know that the time to accept a new queen is about a week, and that's the same period of time we're looking to have the workers just focus on rearing our larvae. So our solution was to put in queen lures and replace them every one to two days. And we looked at the rates of queen cell replacement, supersedure cell production, and they were not, not absent, but low enough that we felt like the workers really were focusing on what they were doing. Yeah, so we did try and avoid that problem of foreign queens messing up the dynamic of the colony over that period of feeding. That's a good question, and one that we really tried to figure out how to best address. Hello. Um, I don't know if it's anything you've touched upon, but I was wondering um, if you know anything about how uh, pollen stress may affect uh, the production of vitalogenin? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is thought to have a big effect on their ability to nurse properly, too. So, um, you know, when we think about having these fat bees that can overwinter well and, and all of the things they need to do with the, for these really nutrient-intensive parts of their lifetime, um, I think that it, we, we personally in our lab do not measure this, but I expect that pollen stress would greatly impact all of the functions of the bees that depend on that, on vitelligenin. I can't answer you specifically from our work, though. Well, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, it's 5.30, and uh, it's time for us to go and uh, find out the primary importance of our own uh, nutrition as well as the yeah. bees. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>